Uh, two questions on FCC. Uh, number one, what's your take on NDMA, and uh, what's the optimum grant to take uh, to achieve uh, sexual ecstasy? Sexual ecstasy on ecstasy? <laughs> oh, on mushrooms. Oh, I see. Well, first about MDMA. Well, there is no doubt that from here to the end of time, whether it be 18 years or a thousand years away, science is going to produce more and more psychoactive drugs. There are psychoactive drugs on the shelf now waiting for human testing and government approval uh, around the world. We cannot explore the brain, we cannot explore neurochemistry without these drugs being uh, a natural consequence of this program of research. MDMA is a cyclotized amphetamine like MDA, like mescaline, which is a, a naturally occurring compound of this type. Um, in the hands of a skilled psychotherapist, uh, MDMA leads to conflict resolution, relationship insights into relationships, this sort of thing. I'm not entirely convinced that it's the silver bullet for these conditions. Every drug that has made its way onto the, the alternative culture scene has first billed itself as a love drug. That's an unfailing market ploy to get a drug to the forefront of public attention. Cannabis was sold to us as a love drug, uh, LSD, psilocybin, ebogaine, MDMA is no different. MD MDMA does promote a certain kind of empathy, not a whole lot of uh, vigorous sexual activity. In terms of of what dose of psilocybin leads you into a, a sexual rather than a visually acute or visionarily ecstatified situation, I would say for a 145 pound person, probably two to three grams is this agitated, sexually active or if no sex is happening, maybe dancing and drumming. In other words, thoroughly aroused, busy, active dose. As the dose rises, you know, activity slows, and finally you just want to sit down, and then finally you just want to lay down. And to, <laughs> then you're into the other phase. Behind you, there was another question. But I was really curious, what, do you have anything to say or uh, you know about the credibility of the author William Cooper, who wrote a book called The Old? This is the flying saucer debunker. And isn't he the one who said that he was the CIA guy for a long time? Well, this is slightly off the track, or might seem to some people to be slightly off the track. Uh, I don't know William Cooper's book. I regard that uh, whole flying saucer thing as a civil war in a leper colony. Uh, but I do think, I do think, having been, like probably most of you, very interested in flying saucers from the time I was a kid and I grew up when it was all happening, a few couple of years ago, I accepted an invitation for the first time to go to a flying saucer conference. If you've never been to one and you're interested in flying saucers, go. You will, be, you will have more insights into the phenomenon in a conference like that than in 10 years of studying it. Because what's perfectly clear is that these people are self-selected for gullibility. <laughs> And it's not their fault. It's just that the the ticket through the front door is, uh, you know, would you believe this? Would you believe this? Uh, I, I think probably what happened, historically speaking, is that, you know, in 1947, when the first UFOs were seen, the it was a weird world. The explosion of the atom bomb the work toward the hydrogen bomb, people didn't know 
Einstein and Truman and all this, they didn't know what it really meant. If they thought that it is conceivable that the solar system is monitored, and it is conceivable that this is the switch which turns on the monitor and brings attention. I mean, they were in awe of the atom bomb, and they realized they were tampering with cosmic forces. And then, at this moment of cosmic awe and realization of tampering, they begin to get reports of spacecraft entering the skies of Earth and interacting with human beings. Well, what they did, the CIA had just been founded in 48 and so forth and so on. What they did is they put a lot of time and effort into infiltrating all these groups that claimed knowledge of what was going on. And as a survivor of the new left, I can tell you, when the government gets interested in infiltrating, I mean, I, there, two out of every three members of SDS was a government informant at the height of its membership. So I believe that what happened was these flying saucer groups were massively infiltrated by the government in the course of its pursuing its constitutional obligation to maintain the public welfare. And by 54 or 55, the government was perfectly convinced that whatever flying saucers were, they did not pose a threat to the integrity of the air defenses of North America. And that was their real concern. But bureaucracies are weird creatures. They really exist only to perpetuate themselves. So at some point inside these agencies, they must have had to face the fact that they had massively infiltrated a bunch of very flaky people, and now their choice was to either end the program, tell the budget people that no, they wouldn't be needing that $10 million this year, or keep going with it, because they now had a group of people self-selected for gullibility. And that group of people became the victims of every chemical experiment, weird technology, propaganda experiment, and so forth and so on, because their friends and relatives had already written them off as completely... Uh, untrustworthy, who would believe them no matter what story they told? So I really felt I was among severely damaged people, uh, and it, wa it wasn't their fault. It's that they, they had become part of something that had become part of something that had become part of something, and they never really had a fighting chance. Do strange light? haunt the skies of Earth, you bet their booties they do. But the flying saucer cults are a social phenomenon and largely unrelated to whatever this anomaly is. Yeah. Uh, with Dr. Dunder and Putman's report, opposite the general edition of technology, do you think we'll come a time when we are indistinguishable from our technology and would that be sort of obvious to speak about in your book? No, I think it would go the other way, that we're moving toward a time when our technology is indistinguishable from us. In other words, I don't want us to all turn into uh, 7180 AD. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, but on the other hand, I could imagine as a hopeful scenario a future world of, let's say, say, 500 or a billion healthy, happy, well-fed people of all races, political persuasions, gender preferences, and so forth and so on. And uh, those people would essentially live as our archaic ancestors did, very little material culture, uh, very nomadic. Uh, but if you could transport yourself into the body of one of these people, you would discover that when they close their eyes, there are menus hanging in space. In other words, the computer that was on the back of the thumbnail, five years later, that computer moves into being a kind of an implant, a black contact 
lens that is sewn into your eyelids at age six, so that when you close your eyes, you're actually looking at an interface. And the entire uh, database of the culture could be placed there. You see, really what computers are doing is they're making what we call the collective unconscious conscious. All data, all images uh, are potentially accessible through uh, the network. And, you know, I'm still getting used to the idea of the network myself. Like I keep thinking, oh, I have this timeline. I could get somebody's chronology and put it at my website. And then I remember, no, no, all I have to do is point to their website. I don't have to copy or move anything. If there is one list, that's all the world needs. Anybody else who needs that list can point to it from their website. So the speed at which new structures can be created is astonishing. I mean, it's almost literally overnight. You can build a website and begin to point at other websites and bring resources into yours. Uh, this is a technology which is going to turn out to not be what people think it is. It's going to be a technology for showing each other the inside of our heads, for showing each other our dreams. Uh, you know, one thing I didn't talk about in the main part of the lecture is that psychedelics are catalysts for language. They speed up and catalyze the language formation process. And a culture cannot evolve any faster than its language evolves. And it cannot be any more glued together than the bandwidth that its languages will tolerate. And so what this technology that is putting in place is going to mean is the way in which it will dissolve boundaries is by making us transparent to each other. I mean, I can imagine a child of the future. Uh, we all bring home our drawings to stick on refrigerators and things like that. In the future, we won't stick them on refrigerators. We will stick them in our website. And everything will go into our website. And by the time we're 25 or something, our website will be the size of the American Museum of Natural History, and you can wander through it. And uh, a, as a gesture of intimacy, you can invite someone else to wander through it. Well, that's who you are. It's your imagination. And uh, I think, in a sense, I've said at times that the cultural enterprise is an effort to turn ourselves inside out. We want to put the body into the imagination, and we want the imagination to replace the laws of physics. With these technologies, we can delicate design principles, or it's certain to be a mess. We effort to turn ourselves inside out. We want to put the body into the imagination, and we want the imagination to replace the laws of physics. With these technologies, we can probably do that, but it'll have to run on psychedelic design principles, or it's certain to be a mess. Yeah. Um, what could you tell us about the problem that some people are referring to with the digestibility of the mushrooms and how it can lead to um, pain and, and some discomfort and um, sometimes to a, like a nightmarish type experience? Well, first of all, let me say this. There are several mushrooms which contain psilocybin, which grow in cow dung. What I urge people to do, if you're serious about this, is to grow your own. Uh, this is moderately self-serving, because I wrote a book about how to grow your own mushrooms. But there are many such books. You don't have to buy mine. You only need it if you want the best one. Uh, but. You see, here, Ed Stamets's book is excellent, and if you want to go large-scale, Stamets's book is the one. But let me say something then. 
uh, after the brain, the stomach is the most heavily innervated organ in the body. And anxiety has a way of cropping up as a stomach ache. So it's a lot of people have anxiety in the first hour of taking mushrooms and they believe that something in the mushroom is giving them gastric distress. It really isn't. It's more like a case of butterflies on an empty stomach because you should take mushrooms on an empty stomach. Uh, you can try a suppository, you can try another drug if you want, but there is in this psychedelic business something to be said for simply disciplining your hind brain. Also, you can suppress nausea with cannabis. So, you know, a mixture of self-discipline, pharmacological steering, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, if, you have, if you have a severe reaction to the mushroom, you probably shouldn't take it. I mean, after all, it is a fungus, and as mammals, we have developed some pretty strong uh, allergenic reactions to fungi, some of us. And uh, certain reactions to psilocybin are not psychedelic reactions, like uh, enormous sweating or something like that. That's more an indication of an allergy. If you're going to get into psychedelics, one of the things you have to do is learn your way around. It, it, psychedelic sophistication doesn't mean you took everything there is in combination with everything there else, else there is at high doses with your friends at rock concerts. It, it means that you figured out what worked for you and then really put the pedal to the metal, you know? Yeah. I recently came across David Pesca's work on formerly rearranged monotonic elements, and we found that these the monotonic heavy metals conduct uh, active superconductors, conduct uh, light force to our nervous system. Are you familiar with this work at all? No, you, you've stumped the star. Uh, I mean, I, I'm interested in organic superconductivity and room temperature superconductivity, uh, but I don't know his work, so I can't comment on it. He said he's going to be coming out with a book in six to nine months called Ormus, O-R-M-E-S, Ormus, which is normally rearranged monotonic I'm sure it will find its way to my death. Now all these hands, oh, he should be the guy you tell me, all right. Um, how much of our consensus reality do you think is based on um, inexorable physical laws, things that aren't of our own creation, and uh, how much, if any, um, is subject to change without notice, simply based on a consensus belief of what should be or what is going to be? How do you think things work? Well, I mean, this is, you, this is sort of where I'm at. I mean, as you were asking the question, I was, my tendency would be to say none, that none of our reality is based on inexorable physical law. But I only want that to be true. I'm not sure it is true. Whitehead used to, he had this thing about what he called stubborn fact. And he said, there are some stubborn facts, and you can cut your philosophy any way you want, but if you don't take account of the stubborn facts, you'll have a problem. Uh, a lot of reality is made of language. How much, I'm not sure, but I, my hope is that a great deal is made of language. Rupert Sheldrick, who's a good friend of mine, and we sort of think along the same lines, he believes that there are not inexorable physical laws, that there are just very old habits. He would think of the speed of light as a very old habit. Uh, these physical constants may be changing. We don't know. I mean, take the speed of light. We've measured it in, on one planet since 1906, 
and cheerfully extrapolate it to every corner of the known universe with no sense that there might be a problem there at all. But yet, you know, if you're a critic of this, you can look at the speed of light as measured from 1906, and you will notice that the values have been slowly going up. It, it's apparently going slightly faster than it was a century ago. Well, people just dump on that and say, no, no, you poor moron, you don't understand. It's that the, it's that the instrumentality has become more precise, and so the measurement may have changed slightly. Oh, yeah? Well, it seems to me in that case, the points should cluster. How come the more recent ones are faster than the earlier ones consistently? In other words, it's not that we're getting measurements which cluster around a value, it's that we're getting measurements which are going out this way, toward faster. I think language is the key to making reality. I think our language is a is a very weak language. Computer languages may be more powerful, uh, you know, VRML or mathematics. But I believe the world is made of language. That's the magical belief. But then the challenge to that belief is, okay, wise guy, so how come the world isn't the way you say it is? Well, <clears throat> that's ungenerous. I think because it, it doesn't work quite like that. Consensus is set by societies, by millions of people. Reality is a phenomenon of many linguistically operating subsystems. Maybe if you and I were stranded on a desert island, we could get a reality going. We probably could, but it would surely be shattered when somebody showed up to take us home again.